Thanks, Eric. That song um, was fun, and it was kind of a tongue twister. And it is true that when we read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, but sometimes in the New Testament, we come across these long lists of names, uh, genealogies they're called, and we can kind of, even I sometimes just skim over them because they're hard to read and hard to pronounce, and what do they mean after all? But it's really important to see that names mean something in the Bible. The Bible's full of names, and it tells us that the story of God isn't just make-believe. It's anchored in the stories of real people, in real time, in real history. And it comes down through the generations and down through the centuries into our stories here today. Because even our names matter to God. And that's a good lead-in for what we're talking about today. Now, if you've heard me speak for any length of time, you know that I, I love stories. In fact, I collect stories, kind of like some people collect stamps or baseball cards. I collect them from all over the place. Stories out of my own life and experience, my family, and you hear those all the time, sometimes multiple times from my friends' lives, from uh, things I see on the internet or read in books or over the news media. So back when the Cubs were playing in the World Series, remember that? <laughs> there were all kinds of stories that you saw around, and I collected some of those. Uh, for example, there was a story that I actually saw in the online version of the Wall Street Journal. I don't usually read that, but I saw this story there. A story of a woman named Hazel Nilsson, who happens to be a big Cubs fan. She was born on August 21st, 1908, just a couple of months before the Cubs won the World Series that year, which means she's now 108 years old and is one of very human beings on the face of the earth that have lived through two Cubs World Series championships. Then there was also kind of a cool story about a guy named uh, Wayne Williams who once made a promise to his father that whenever the Cubs did make the World Series, they'd listen to a game together. It was his promise. So he drove from North Carolina to Greenwood, Indiana, a trip of 650 miles to a military seminary where, a cemetery where his father had been buried as a Navy vet in 1980. And there he sat next to his father's grave and listened to Game 7 of the World Series on his iPhone because he promised. It's kind of a cool story. Then there was Central Baptist Church of Springfield, Illinois. Posted this invitation on Facebook. You may not be able to see it. I think Andrew might have shared it a few weeks ago. But it says, FYI, if you made any promises during the bottom of the ninth, service starts at 1045 Sunday morning, we'll save you a seat. I like that thinking. We're in the third week of a series called The Promise. We started out as a way of leading up to what we're looking at today with God's call to a man named Abram, an ancient man, to leave his home and go to a place he'd never seen before. With that call came this astonishing promise to a man and his wife who had no children. God said, I will make you a great nation, and through you I will bless all the families of earth. It was a promise of an heir, a son to carry on his name. Next, we saw in Genesis 15, as Pastor Jeff explained to us, that God established his covenant with Abram. That is a sacred promise, uh, in essence, that God promised to fulfill both sides of the arrangement by his covenant. You remember that teaching. Now, today we look at the promise of of faithfulness. And before we read the story that we want to look at today, a little bit of background. Remember, Abram, later called Abraham, obeyed God's call, trekked 600 miles from Haran uh, up north all the way down to the land of Canaan. And if you're in one of our bestseller book clubs, you've been reading through this story, and you know that when he got to the land of Canaan, all kinds of stuff happened that we're not including in our series. There was a famine, so he had to take Sarai, his wife, down to Egypt just to, to be able to live. And once they got there, he told Sarah to pretend that he was, she was his sister, not his wife. So the Pharaoh wanted to take her as a wife. He wouldn't have to kill Abraham to get her. Just a weird story. And then Abram and his lot nephew separate. Then Abram rescues Lot from a bunch of pagan kings. And then a strange guy named Melchizedek shows up and blesses Abram. What's all that about? But what didn't happen in all the stuff that, that did happen, what did not happen was a son, an heir. In fact, 10 years go by, and nothing happens. Sarah is still childless. Abram has no heir. So then in Genesis 16, if you read through the story, Sarai comes up with an idea. Now, I know Sunday morning is kind of a PG crowd. This next story is kind of PG-13, so I'm not going to give all the details. 
But Sarah's not been able to give Abram a child, so she comes up with this idea. She's going to give her Egyptian servant girl, a woman named Hagar, to Abram as a surrogate. Definitely not God's plan. And interestingly, Abraham doesn't argue. He just goes along with the plan. I'll let you fill in the blanks there. And sure enough, Hagar does bear a son. His name is Ishmael. Now, God doesn't punish Abram and Sarai for this indiscretion, for this decision. He's not all that happy about it either. But another 13 years go by. Nothing. We hear nothing of the promise. Then in chapter 17, God does three things in succession. He reaffirms his covenant with Abram, this time requiring Abraham and all male descendants to be circumcised as a sign, a mark of the covenant. Then he changes Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, so we can use those names from now on. Uh, and he, God often does that kind of thing, changes names when he's about to do something really special. And then he restates his promise to Abraham to give him a son through his wife, Sarah. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Here's what I want you to hear. The, but here's how the Bible describes Abraham. This is Abraham. Here's how Abraham responds to God's promise this time. Chapter 17, verse 17. Abraham fell face down, and he laughed. And he said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at age 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Quite literally, Abraham falls on his face laughing at God and suggests maybe our plan will work better, Lord. Just bless Ishmael. In the very next verse, we read, Then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, and that leads us to the story we look at today. Abram is now 100 years old. It's been 25 years since he followed God's promise to go to a place he'd never seen before. A short while after the conversation while Abraham fell down and laughed, he's visited by three strangers. He's sitting in front of his tent, and three strangers that we soon find out are God's way of speaking to him again. And here's what the story says. Genesis 18, we'll pick it up in verse 9. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, you know, it goes from three men to the Lord, just like that, because God is speaking to him. I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. I'm going to pause there. If you haven't noticed it yet, one of the things we've seen so far throughout this whole journey is the almost embarrassing honesty of the Bible. The Bible doesn't cover up the flaws of its main characters. There are just no perfect people in the Bible. I think that's kind of good news for us, don't you think? Isn't it good to know you, you don't have to be perfect to have faith? Isn't it good to know the church isn't a place for people who are already perfect? There's no perfect people in the Bible. Abram and Sarah concocted a plan to fulfill God's promise themselves, since he obviously wasn't doing anything about it, so they use her servant girl as a surrogate. It's kind of an unsavory story. And then they laugh at God. And in this part of the story, there's something almost funny about the way it happens. God's talking to Abraham outside the tent, but Sarah's behind the door flap listening in because she wants to know what's going on. She overhears her name, that she's going to have a baby, so she laughs inside herself. Not out loud, but to herself. And God says, why did she laugh? Sarah goes, I didn't laugh. Who, me? I didn't laugh. God says, yes, you did laugh. That's funny to me because we often try to hide things from God, don't we? We try to convince ourselves we can hide that attitude or that thought or that sin or that doubt or that pain from God. We might as well come clean because he knows already. He knows our heart. Then the whole next chapter we're going to skip over because there's this weird conversation between Abraham and God negotiating about destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, but that doesn't fit our context and it's really long, so we're going to skip over that. Come to the culmination of the story in chapter 21, verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. If, you, if you're looking in your own Bible, you're reading it sometimes, underline both those as he had said and as he had promised. 
And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So let's dig in. First thing I see here that we need to see once again is the promise of a son. The promise of a son. The birth of a child is always, always, always a miracle. Always. There's just no way to go through the whole birthing process, whether you're a participant or a spectator, as in my case, and not come to that conclusion. Birth is miraculous, but it's not easy. One of our boys was born after a particularly grueling labor process for both mom and baby. It just lasted a long time. It was just difficult. And he came to us looking like he had been through like a 15-round prize fight. I mean, my dad likes to say that most babies look vaguely like Winston Churchill. And it's kind of true when you really think about it. But our baby looked like Rocky at the end of the first Rocky movie. You know, just, just beat up and bruised and battered. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I went back a couple days after we would brought him home to pick up his birth pictures. For some reason, they take these pictures right after a baby is born. In the case of our son, his head hadn't had a chance to go back to, like, normal shape. So he took his picture, and I, it was in the folder. So I went back to get the picture to take it home because we want to have the birth pictures. And there was this really kind, sweet, like, grandma-looking lady sitting behind the counter. I'm sure a volunteer. So I walked up and said, you know, my son was born. I want to pick up his birth picture. She said, what's his name? I gave her his name. So she flipped through these folders on the counter. Oh, here it is. And then she took it out, and she couldn't resist. She said, let's, let's take it. Let's see how he looks. And then she went, oh, my. <laughs> and she couldn't help herself. And I then she looked up at me, and she realized what she had done. And I said, I know, I know, but it, he looks better now, so it's, it's fine. But this we have here in the Bible is a birth story. There's no two ways about it. It's a birth story. And through this whole series, we've been trying to connect the promise of a son to Abraham and Sarah with the promise of a son to Mary and Joseph. So how do we get there? Well, God called Abram, promised to make his name great. And the only way that can happen is if he has a son, an heir, who could also have descendants that become a great nation. And then he says, I'm going to bless all the families of earth through you. That's going to come through that nation, Israel, as one comes from that nation that blesses the whole world, and that's the Messiah or the Christ. That's how that all fits together. And the whole Old Testament, from Genesis all the way through, is looking forward to the promise of that son. Some 700 years before Jesus' birth, the prophet Isaiah wrote, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and I will call him Emmanuel. Then the prophet Micah goes so far as to tell us where the son will be born. Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. Now back to Abraham for a second. At this point in the story, up until today, up until chapter uh, 21, the promise has not yet been fulfilled. Abraham is still without an heir. And that leads us to the second thing we have to see here, and that is the struggle of faith. The struggle of faith. I think most of us would probably agree that the Cubs winning the World Series, remember that? Was the biggest sports story of the year. If not for the presidential election, it might have been the biggest story, period, in America. Now, I know not all of you are Cubs fans. I, I get that. And if you want to live outside of God's will, that's, that's up to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, you don't have to be a Cubs fan. My brother's an Indian fan. You know, go figure. So I do want to point out, however, that during that whole time, uh, there was something else going on at a deeper level. There really was. I want to try to explain the phenomenon. Because I noticed that many people, me included, that were Cubs fans, and I had to spend a couple days during that World Series with my brother in Cle near, in between Cleveland and Akron, where he lives. He's been an Indian fan for a long, long time. And I began to notice that both fan bases were speaking the language not just of baseball, not just, you know, balls and strikes and double plays and sacrifice flies, but also the language of faith. For example, both Cubs and Indians fans believed they were under a curse. Cubs' curse was 108 years. Indians' curse was 68 years. 
They talk openly about a curse. The story we're in starts with a curse. started in the Garden of Eden. They talked about long-suffering. They talked about hope. They talked about believing. Indian fans started calling Cleveland Believe Land. You saw these signs all over that region. When the cameras panned the crowd, you saw people literally in a posture of prayer during games, like this guy. You saw it over and over again. I would go so far as to say that being a Cubs fan or an Indians fan served as a, as a kind of religion almost. Maybe you think that's going too far. One of my sons shared with me a, a, a song written by lead singer of uh, the rock band Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder, who's a big Cubs fan. The song is called Someday We'll Go All The Way. Listen to the, some of the words of the song. Don't let anyone say that it's just a game, for I've seen other teams and it's never the same. When you're born in Chicago, you're blessed and you're healed. Someday we'll go all the way. And there's no, here's to the men and the legends we've known, teaching us faith and giving us hope. United we stand and united we'll fall down to our knees the day we win it all. Our diamond, our jewel, the home of our joy and our tears, keeping traditions and wishes made new, a spiritual feeling if I ever knew to think someday we'll go all the way. You change a word or two, then that could be in the New Testament because it's all about faith. A sports writer named Lynn Bremer wrote this, Is Cub fandom a religion? Put it this way, In the past 28 years, I've been to Wrigley Field 794 times. I've been to church 11. I've defined worship often as the offering of extravagant devotion to someone or something. Worship. I think that's what was really going on during the World Series at a deeper level. It wasn't about baseball. It was about faith. It was about worship. See, as human beings, we are hardwired for faith. We are hardwired for worship. We're created with the longing to believe in something bigger than ourselves, and we will fill that spot in our hearts with almost anything, even baseball teams. So while the Cubs might be a, a misplaced faith or a misplaced worship, there are similarities. For example, faith in the story we're looking at today is hard. Faith is long, requires waiting. Faith requires hope. Back to Abraham's story, God made a covenant promise to Abraham, but it's been 25 years. 25 years since the call came, and Abraham obeyed. He went to a place he'd not been before. 25 years of waiting for that pregnancy test to come back positive. 25 years. And now they're old, way past childbearing time. See, I think this part of the story suggests to us that Abraham and Sarah had long since kind of given up faith. For all they could tell, God had gone completely silent. They hear nothing for 13 years after Ishmael's born. Evidently, <coughs> excuse me, God is unable or unwilling to make good in that promise. And so when they finally hear him reaffirming that promise, they do what? They laugh. Both of them. They literally laugh in God's face. This is important for us to see. Here's why. I think maybe for most of us here in the room today, uh, the Advent Christmas season is um, a time of lights and fun and celebrations and decorations and family. It's all good. Perhaps for most of us, together at Christmas, this little slogan we use is, is a good thing. <coughs> cause for celebration. But I have a feeling, in fact, I know for a fact, that for others, just to say together at Christmas is kind of like a knife in your heart. Because for one reason or another, your family cannot be together at Christmas. Someone is serving in the military overseas and can't make it home. They're in harm's way. Maybe there's a brokenness in a relationship or a family member is sick. Or maybe someone's gone. Never going to be back again for Christmas. Or maybe you dread this season because of the constant talk of a birth of a child. It's all about the birth of a child, the miraculous birth of a child. And all that talk simply reminds you of your own pain and loss. Maybe the loss of a child. Maybe the inability to conceive a child. What I want you to see is if in any way that is you today, that this story is for you. I think Abraham's faith slowly leaked away. I think he ran out of hope. He gave up on the God who had promised. He actually laughed, fell on his face and laughed. And I wonder, 
Is there any way in which you've ever felt like that, sort of laughed at God? I mean, not out loud. I mean, we, we wouldn't do it out loud, but maybe secretly, inwardly, like, <laughs> when's the last time you showed up for me? Tell me another one, God. Sort of this sarcastic loss of faith. Sarah also struggled. I mean, she's the one who had ideas. She got, she got so tired of waiting, she gave her husband her slave girl. And then she laughed at God. She laughed at the promise of a baby in her old age. But here's what I want you to notice. Notice that their struggle with faith, as great as it was, their loss of faith at times, their cynicism, their discouragement, maybe their anger at God, did not disqualify them from his promise. It did not disqualify them. Why? Jeff talked about this last week, about how faith and doubt are often intermingled, how faith has this uncomfortable but undeniable relationship with doubt. But struggling with faith does not disqualify us, does not disqualify you from God's promise. Why? Because God established the covenant. And the covenant was not based on your faithfulness, on Abraham and Sarah's faithfulness, but on his faithfulness. Because he covered both sides of it, remember? And that leads us to the third thing we have to see in this story, and I'm calling it the son called laughter. The son called laughter. Let me explain. Have you ever noticed how things are sometimes funnier in places where you're not supposed to laugh? Like remember in school, you know, you'd be in class and you got a, like a really serious teacher, professor, but then somebody's stomach makes a weird growling sound or some other odd bodily noise happens. And it gets so funny that you can't contain yourself. And the more you try to hold it in, the more you want to laugh. And you start snorting and stuff comes out of your nose. And, and it, it, you, you just want to laugh. Well, sometimes it happens in church. Has it ever happened to you in church? It's happened to me in church. A couple of years ago, I was actually guilty of causing that kind of laughter myself in this church. I hesitate to tell the story. Some of you were here. And you'll remember as soon as I tell it. Uh, and it might, I'm, I'm afraid to tell it because it might hijack the rest of today's message because you won't be able to get a certain word out of your mind, but I'm going to try. I was leading a communion service right here on this platform, um, and I was giving a prayer right before we pass out the bread and cup. So it's a really quiet, worshipful, holy time. And I was trying to connect communion to God's promise to forgive our sin, to make our hearts clean again, which is what communion is all about. But I didn't have a prayer written out. I was just ad-libbing that day, which I sometimes will do. Sometimes I write things down. But I was in the middle of my prayer, and I said something like this. Thank you for making a way to set us free from the sin that clings to our hearts like. And I don't know why I said it that way, but I did. But when I, as soon as I said like, I needed an analogy. I said clings like. Now what clings? And I'm thinking in real time, because it was a sentence, I couldn't just pause and look up something. What clings? I'm a, a really fast. Lint? Does lint, lint clings to sweaters? Mud clings to boots? What clings? And the word that was coming to my mind that I did not want to say, don't know, do not say that word out loud, and yet I said the word out loud. I said, clings to our hearts like barnacles. I said the word barnacles out loud <laughs> in church. And that word is funny by itself, but I wasn't finished yet because right, I was only partway into the analogy, I needed something for barnacles to cling to. And I'm thinking, really, what do barnacles cling to? They cling to boats, uh, they cling to uh, ships, driftwood, what do they cling to? And this is what I said before communion. That clings to our hearts, some of you remember, like barnacles to a whale, is what I said. <laughs> and as soon as the words came out of my mouth, I wanted to laugh out loud. <laughs> Why did I say that? But I couldn't laugh because I was praying before communion. So I really quickly said amen and walked off the platform. It took me, it took me about five seconds to get down to my seat, which is where I sit right down there. My family sits all right behind me. All four boys were here that morning. By the time I got to my seat, I could feel my seat actually shaking <laughs> because my entire family was laughing so hard. <laughs> I, st I snuck a peek, and they were, tears were running down their face. <laughs> tears were running down my wife's face. And that cracked me up. And I'm thinking, i got to get back up there and lead communion. I'm going to burst out laughing because you just can't do that in church, right? Or can you? Faith isn't supposed to be funny, is it? Or sometimes maybe it is. I want you to see here, God says the child's name will be Isaac. And there's a kind of joke in the story that we can miss because we don't speak Hebrew anymore. In Hebrew, the name Isaac means, get this, laughter or he laughs. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. 
God has chosen a name for this promise, this promised son that has a double meaning. On the one hand, it means, refers to the incredulous and maybe sarcastic laughter of both Abraham and Sarah at the outrageous promise that they're going to have a son in their old age. It was the laughter of disbelief, even doubt. And then on the other hand, there's the laughter that is the joyous celebration of the unimaginable blessing of God. The laughter of fulfilled promise. And Sarah gets it. Let me read this verse again, because you might have missed it the first time. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Isaac means laughter. And everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said, who would have thunk it, that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Here's the question. What kind of laughter is this? What's God saying to us here? This is the laughter of a God who delights in fulfilling his promise. This, in the big picture, is the great laughter of salvation. Every year at this time, we read from Luke 2. Famous words, and I'll get there in a second, but my, one of my favorite writers named Frederick Buechner says this in a book he wrote a while back. He traces his own spiritual rebirth to one phrase in one sermon he heard in New York City when he was 27 years old. He was a struggling writer, had just gone through a failed relationship, so he wandered into church one day. church happened to be pastored by a famous uh, preacher named George Buttrick. It was right around the time Queen Elizabeth had been crowned in England, so he was comparing her coronation to how Christ is crowned king in the hearts of believers. And here's what he said. Beekner writes, The preacher said, Jesus is crowned king in our hearts among confession, tears, and great laughter. And then he says, At the phrase great laughter, for reasons I've never satisfactorily understood, the great wall of China crumbled and Atlantis rose up out of the sea, and on Madison Avenue at 73rd Street, tears leapt from my eyes as if I'd been struck across the face. You see it? Jesus is the great laughter of God. Every year at this time, we read from Luke 2, Listen to the story. You know the words. And at the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you, what? Good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Jesus is the great laughter of the God who takes on human flesh. This is the great laughter of the God who shows up of all places as a baby lying in an animal feeding trough. Jesus is the God who goes to the cross to finish the work of the covenant that's begun here with Abraham. Jesus is the great laughter that our sins can be forgiven. This is the great laughter that this life, with all its pain and poverty and hunger and abuse and disease and dysfunction, is not all there is. This is the great laughter that all that is broken and wrong with the world, all that is broken and wrong within us, will be restored and made right again. This is the great laughter that even death itself will be swallowed up in life one day. This is the great laughter that the God who made a promise of a son to a hundred-year-old man and his 90-year-old wife, whose faith was running on empty, is the same God who promises new birth, new life, and new hope to us. This is the great laughter of the gospel. Would you bow in prayer as I close? Lord, I thank you so much for your word today. For the story of this ancient couple who waited and waited and waited for your promise, who struggled mightily with faith, and then who received your great laughter. Through their story, lead us to your story. You, the God who came to us, the God who gave himself for us, and the God who promises one day, his own great laughter. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I love
that line, doesn't matter what I feel, doesn't matter what I see, the hope will always be your promises to me. And that's true. If you're struggling today with that promise or those promises, you want to pray with someone about it, our prayer teams will be on the either corner of the room today. I'll be up here as well. This afternoon, we're going to celebrate those promises at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. We'll make sure the parking lot's clear, walkways are clear, drive safely. We hope we'll see you and celebrate with us later today. Receive now the benediction. And by the way, leave the chairs right where they are. We need them for this afternoon. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, I have told you these things, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Amen. Have a great day. Oh, wondering where.